Thank you for staying on Joy News today. Let's cross over to Parliament now, uh, where Minister-designate for Education, Dr. Matthew Opukupempe, is before Parliament's Appointments Committee. As we add as part of your record. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Um, are there anybody on the majority side who wants to ask questions on the CV? On the majority side before I come to you. Very well, then, Honorable. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, congratulations, my brother. I would want you to kindly take note of all the additions you have made and let us have the amendments, the committees you have just uh, told us. You didn't provide the committees, so kindly let's have that. And uh, <clears throat> page two, when you were giving your profile, you said you were at the UST. Yes. Primary school, but on the CV is KNUST, so you may. No, uh, it is the same university. The name was added, and I've adopted it. It's Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, also and previously known as University of Science and Technology. If you come with me to page four of your CV, there's something happening. I'll need your clarification. Under your certificate, it must be the MBCHB on page four, you indicate 1995, but on page two, you have 1994 as a completion year, 91 to 94. And you see that the same thing is happening for your BSc as well. You have 1992 on page four, but on page two is 1991 as your completion year. Can you kindly clarify exactly what is going on here? A completion years are different from years certificates are awarded, and that is a discrepancy. So the certificates were awarded a year after you completed? A few months after. The MRCS Glasgow, that does not appear to have been accounted for on page two. Is that what you obtained at Erasmus University? Nope. At Erasmus University, it was MSc in clinical epidemiology. In Glasgow, is uh, becoming a member of the Royal College of Surgeons. There were three or four houses in England you could, UK you could uh, apply from. And I sat the Glasgow exam. And so, is a fellowship, is a, it's not an academic degree, it's a professional degree. So that's why you don't see it somewhere and you see it at another place. I'm quite curious, uh, still on page four, uh, after all the years of investment that Ghana made into your medical practice, you gave Ghana only two years of medical practice. Why? June 2000. Uh, February 1999 to June 2003. And, and uh, no, that's, that's, that's what you gave to the UK. Uh, you gave the UK four years. You gave Ghana two years, August 1995 to January 1997. Why is that? And when you even returned from the UK, you appear to have totally abandoned the medical profession. And you set up a private security firm. Um, after all the years or many years of investment, why why is that? Uh, very interesting. Um, if you observe, immediately I finished my house job 
um, I went and proceeded to do the master's in clinical research. Um, when I finished and I came back, um, I decided I had the opportunity to go to the UK to go and do a postgraduate course in surgery fellowship. So I went to the UK. And um, interestingly, when I got my membership, I, I couldn't leave politics for that long. So I came with the intention of contesting in 2004 general elections. Um, that was uh, aborted. Uh, I said it wasn't my turn. So I waited my turn patiently. I couldn't go back into practice knowing very well that my mind was made up. So I found something to do, and I did it in those other subjects that I found interesting. Uh, till a door opened, and I put my hat in the ring, and I was selected, and then I was elected. Then I came to Parliament in 2008. So you say you found other interests. Are yeah. we to take it that you lost interest in the medical no, profession? I found secondary interest. I couldn't go back to medicine and then leave very much soon after. So I found those other interests that I harbored uh, to find expression. If you come along with me to page five, uh, knowing you, I, I know you have some philosophical underpinnings to why you have done this. Membership of professional bodies. Uh, this committee is used to members saying they either belong to the Ghana Bar Association or the Ghana Medical Association. You have uh, indicated the Ghana Medical and Dental Council. Uh, can you explain to this committee why you have done that? The, the Ghana, well, our professional body, recognized as professionals in this country for doctors, is Ghana General, Ghana Medical and Dental Council. Uh, Ghana Medical Association is just an association. It is not, it doesn't confer on you a professional status. Neither does it even grant you a professional status. It's for those who want to belong to the Ghana Medical Association, it, be it all that they are only doctors who are allowed. The, in the UK, when I was practicing, the professional association is called General Medical Council. So you find out that you see Ghana Medical and Dental Council, and the UK counterpart is the General Medical Council. I also see that you carried out a complete project management cycle at Ripper International UK. Are you a Prince Two holder? No. Prince Two is one of the courses you can do uh, in project management cycle. Uh, RIPA is the Royal Institute of. Um, uh, the name RIPA was the Royal Institute of um, Public Administration just like our GIMPA, and it offered professionals training courses in different areas of public administration. So we went to do a project, a course in complete project management. I just wanted to understand what it meant and what you do. <clears throat> I was there, that's why I asked. RIPA? Uh, yeah. I Interesting. Have, I have the Prince too. Yeah, okay. um, you did Prince too at RIPA? Yes, okay. at RIPA. Okay. Uh, back to page five, I just want you to uh, help us with specific date. You, you give us the whole month. You have done very well with the other parts, but uh, with the leadership, innovation, and strategy, and the India-Africa business conclave, you only give us the month, November 2013 and March 2011. Uh, do you have the specific dates for this? The specific dates are on the certificate which is inside this room. Mr. Chairman, my one last... Moment. One moment, yeah. you said certificate is inside this room. There's no certificate before me. If it's not before me, then it's not inside this room. Well noted. Uh, 
So um, are you offering to make it available to the committee upon request? Yes, I would make it available to the committee upon request. Mr. Chairman, my last concern will be on the final page, page six, references. He decides to keep them in the closet, like his certificates. He says, on demand. So we hereby demand. <laughs> Interesting, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I said on demand because certificates or referees, uh, depending upon what you're applying for, they categorically tell you what type of reference or referee they want. Some may want academic, some may want professional, some may want somebody who has known you for 20 years or 30 years. Uh, this is not the job I'm applying for. So I couldn't bring a referee or a reference till I'm told by the committee that we want a reference in this category, and I'll provide one. Um, we gave you the guidelines, and the set of guidelines included that you provide referees. If you had any problems, why didn't you get back to the committee? Probably that is the evidence now. What is in evidence now? Uh, yes. What? I didn't understand which type of referee. And there was no communication of channel available, apart from the fact that I'm on the committee. And on the committee, not to expose members, I have discussed it with one or two members of the committee here, uh, that my reluctance was not an inability, but an unaware situation that I find myself in. But I know that I can provide reference if you so desire. Please provide reference on your integrity and your competence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll do that. Chairman, Chairman, I'll be interested in a referee which is a professional, probably in the course of his medicine, if he was dealing with a hernia, and he had problems that we uh, want to be able to, to, to know how well he fared in terms of ethical standards. So give us one professional uh, reference, then one political reference. Mr. Speaker, I have got four. So I, <laughs> I have got four. Integrity, competence, professional, uh, political. Okay, thank you. Um, Honorable Okujato, are you, are you done? Very well. Does anybody want to ask any question on his CV? Otherwise, I have one, then I move on. I see no... Uh, any reference to your practice in Kumasi, the, uh, uh, the Dr. Kankam's clinic, where I, you and I, the building from which we used to practice, I was a top, you were down. And I don't see any reference that you did any work uh, at that clinic. Rightly so, Mr. Speaker, because I have done a lot of locums in a lot of places. That in itself will be about 10 sheets. Locums are not really uh, your, 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 your practice. Uh, it's where, uh, because of, uh, if you want to earn your keep, uh, you go to seek uh, your senior colleagues, if they can let you do some afternoon jobs in your own spare time. And, I, and you remember very well that I used to come there most times in the afternoon. That's why we could meet. Because in the mornings you were not there and I was not there because you were in court and I was somewhere else. But we met mostly the afternoon. So Mr. Speaker, it's true. I've done lots of locums, but I didn't increase, include it in my CV. Very well. And now we'll get to um, the main agenda. Uh, we'll start from... All right. Um, Honorable Suhini. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and um, congratulations, Honorable Nominee. Thank you. Maybe before my question, if I am indulged, let me take this opportunity to apologize to the Chairman of the Committee uh, for uh, my, uh, you know, the fact that I lost my temper at some point yesterday. I, didn't, I sincerely apologize to you if I came across as, as bad. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, Mr. Dr. Matteo Poku Prempe, what are the plans as far as you have seen in place to, one, abolish the payment of utilities in tertiary institutions as promised, two, extend free Wi-Fi to SHS and university campuses as promised, and three, how much the student loan will be increased to and when? Mr. Speaker, as far as the three questions are concerned, I can say on authority that if this House confirms me, I would come with definite answers. This is a House of Record, and I can guess. I'm not a Minister of Education. <coughs> I haven't seen His Excellency's approvals on these issues, and I wouldn't hesitate to guess on those three things. Mr. Chairman, is the honorable nominee suggesting to this committee that he has seen no such plan to make this real? Plans can be plans, and it will remain plans if it's not implemented. Times that plans do get implemented, that is when I'll come to the House and give the record. Mr. Chairman, respectfully, I was seeking the nominee to tell us the plans he has seen. Mr. Chair, unless I don't get to the question, but I insist that this is the House of Records, and I'm serving at the pleasure, if the House confers me, at the pleasure of His Excellency the President. I can sit here and the House would confer me and will not even end up in the Ministry of Education. And, and, and I don't think I am obliged to divulge plans if they are not executive decisions that is going to be implemented. Mr. Chairman, I was, I was expecting your guidance because uh, these are promises in the NPP manifesto. And I am just asking the nominee to tell us the plans that he has seen that have been put in place for the implementation of these manifesto promises. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The governing manifesto for the next four years is the MPP manifesto. And insofar as those specific manifesto promises have been made, the next Minister of Education would have to advise and seek cabinet approval for it to probably be included in the budget or any other government document. For those plans to materialize, then we can talk about it. Honorable um, Barbara Asha. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Congratulations, Dr. Prempe. Thank you. Thank you. I have three questions. One, people advocated for the four year system of SHS education. And truly, when it was instituted by the Kufos administration, we all knew, or we all know the outcome. The students did extremely well. I would want to find out from you, yes, they did. Yes, because I'm a teacher and I know how they performed in um, the school that I, I was teaching, I am teaching. Is this policy, do you, is this policy, or do you think we can revisit this policy as a nation? I think His Excellency must decide, uh, based upon expert advice and opinion, whether we go back to three or four years. I don't see a specific manifesto promise on that, 
that uh, we govern with expert opinion and expert advice and look and sense the political temperature for His Excellency to decide. If he so comes to that decision, and I am confirmed as a minister, I will see to the prosecution in the House of a four-year SHS. But that decision has not been made. Um, let me do a follow-up. Do you think it's advisable for these decisions or decisions of the life of students be left in the hands of politicians? Our life is left in the hands of politicians insofar as governance is concerned. And we have chosen that as a nation. It's not every expert advice that politicians would have to follow verbatim. We look also more than the expert opinion. Uh, and, and, and we have to accept that in a democratic space, the ultimate decision makers are the political heads. Thank you very much. My second question. In our manifesto, in the NPP manifesto, it says the NPP will motivate teachers. Chairman, just Can you for tell us, us? Just for us to follow college. Page, Sorry, page, page, yeah, page yeah. 31. Thank you very much. I want to find out how you intend to motivate teachers of this nation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, how I intend probably doesn't matter. How the government intends or what the government puts into action is what will matter. But teacher motivation and teacher as the center of the MPP educational reform is very well stated in our manifesto and other pronouncement made by His Excellency the President. The teacher should be the fulcrum, the pivot of which our educational success should be measured. No matter what you put in, you need the teacher to ensure that you get quality educational outcomes. The educational outcomes we know are better students, better informed, knowledgeable students, students with good skills, with the attitude and aptitudes to work, as captured in the Ghana's Educational Policy Act 778. It's clear. But before you can do that, you have to look at the cost implications. You have to look at the incentive package. You have to be discriminatory against whether, whether it's rural or urban teacher. These decisions would have to be taken by His Excellency uh, upon advice and recommendations. And then we'll see. But we have stated that without the teacher, our educational reform would come to zero. So the teacher as the center of uh, quality educational outcomes it's imperative that MPP does something about this. His Excellency and Adi Dankwe Kufado assures me, assures me that I could read because I've been, I was taught by a teacher. So the teacher first is the MPP manifesto. If I'm allowed a follow-up to the honorable uh, member's uh, question, since teacher first and uh, you prioritize teacher, what will you do for the teacher and when? Thank you, Mr. S Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I, in being named as the leader of the transitional team on education, I had the opportunity of interacting, or the team had the opportunity of interacting with teachers. Mm -hmm. I'll through their unions, and they have a litany of problems that we have to address. We have a litany of problems where, if you care, that I can share it with you. And as the Minister for Labor Chairman, Relations, we can share with as us the Minister for Relations, you know that one of the sore points was the validation process being rightly done, uh, which I support, which the teacher unions do support, that teachers must be validated. But, Mr. Speaker, the validation cannot continue indefinitely. Uh, and the validation has continued, and teachers believe that it has continued unfairly. Uh, the numbers are staggering, Mr. Speaker. There are 117,000 plus teachers referred for validation. About 60,000 have been validated. And of that 60,000 that has been validated, only 43,000 have their validation processes been done for them to get and keep, and their keep. So you have nearly 70,000 teachers whose even validation alone is in limbo. And the teacher unions have impressed upon us to, as a matter of uh, urgent action, 
complete that validation process so that they know whether it is true that those features exist or not. This is only one of the many problems that they already have. My last question. On the same page, those are highlights of the MPP manifesto. It says, uh, teachers will be treated with respect and we shall ensure that teacher salaries and allowances are paid regularly and on time. How do you intend to achieve this? Thank you. Thank you. If you recruit a teacher, if you recruit a teacher, you have, as the employer have recruited the teacher, and you should have plans in place for the teacher to be paid promptly and very promptly. You don't recruit somebody if you have no plans to pay the person. Once we can balance the number of people we can recruit financially, then the recruitment should be done so that those people can be paid. The, 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 the elephant in the room is called financial clearance. So the financial clearance can be, can be instituted immediately so that the teacher who is already going to serve probably in, in a er, rural area uh, gets paid and pay becomes one of his last problems. Thank you very much. I'm done. Anawayaga. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, and congratulations, Honorable Matu Prempe. Uh, we know you on the floor of the House to be very active, and uh, here you are before this committee. A number of questions have been asked about education sector policy and actions that will be taken to implement manifesto promises. And the impression I get is that you are deferring to the president. But I assume he's nominating you for appointment to the post of Minister for Education so that you will assist him to deal with the issues of education. So can you tell us how you will ensure that the policy of extending ICT infrastructure to uh, senior high schools and tertiary institutions will be implemented? Thank you. Um, I, I hope, Mr. Chairman, the questioner is not leading me into the situation where he thinks I am undermining another questioner's statements. I would never do that. The facts should be clear. Uh, if you want, you are soliciting my opinion. Uh, it's different from asking me for the what plans I have seen. Uh, your question. Your member, please answer the question. Your question, taking ICT to schools. <laughs> there are already government projects in the pipeline. Uh, some to do with e-governance, some to do with e-transform, being sponsored by donor partners, Ghana government itself, and, and things like that. Uh, government has a backbone agency that looks at vice fiber optic called NITA. Uh, if I am confirmed, my first thing is we'll be sit down with NITA or the government agencies that we will collaborate with and find out the gaps that we can identify in sending fiber to these secondary schools. What other technologies are available to bridge the fiber gaps so that we have to get every school connected before we can even begin to roll out Wi-Fi within the premises of those schools. Those are decisions or actions I'll take if this house hopefully confirms me and I become the substantive minister. I have those in my mind, but till I'm confirmed and I'm sworn in, it will still remain in my mind. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, I've looked at the NPP manifesto, and I assume a commitment in the manifesto to work towards free, universal, basic education. I also assume a commitment in the manifesto to work towards uh, free senior high uh, 
education. But if you look at Article 25, Clause 1C of our Constitution, it says that higher education shall be made equally accessible to all on the basis of capacity by every appropriate means, and in particular, by progressive introduction of free education, progressive introduction of free education at higher education level, which is tertiary education. The Get Fund legislation, if you recall, impose uh, VAT, which is supposed to be used largely for investments in tertiary education, even though from time to time, uh, policymakers have modified and used the resources, sometimes for basic, most of the time also for uh, senior high education. Question is, pursuant to this constitutional commitment to progressively introduce free education, students in tertiary institutions and work towards progressively introducing free education at the tertiary level. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have to consolidate the base and move on. I remember His Excellency John Ramani Mahama telling Ghanaians that even the F cube, we haven't done it how much more free education around the 2012 education. Yeah. Very, very good argument. You consolidate the base, then you move on. Fortunately, unlike the FQ, progressively free tertiary education is not time bound. Just like progressively free secondary education in our constitution. So I think my first priority is to make sure that the KGs and the primaries and the JHS and the SSS, including vocational and technical education agriculture, is well consolidated. Those are the products go that go into secondary school, especially now that the UN's right to basic education that the UN ensures, that basic, the UN right to education is being changed gradually to a right of right to education up to secondary level. We have to guarantee the masses of our people to be of sufficient knowledge and value and skill acquisition and technical ability uh, before we probably, if the country can afford, move towards those directions. Chairman, before the Honorable Ayerga comes back, probably at your pleasure with his TED, I note that right from when the Honorable Alassane Suhini and Ablakwa and our colleague even attempted to refer the nominee to the MPP manifesto, may I remind him that under Article 55 of the Constitution, it is a constitutional assumption that you may be Last uh, question, and before I, I do that, just to refer you to the MPP manifesto, pages 111 and 112, uh, 
um, how MPP intends to uh, reduce the financial burden on tertiary education students has been spelled out. So you may uh, be guided by that. I shouldn't be showing you the MPP manifesto and the details, but uh, if you look at it, you will see. Last one is about um, technical and vocational education. Uh, technical and vocational education has really suffered a lot in our country. And I have heard uh, His Excellency, the President, then a uh, flag bearer candidate, uh, romanticize about how he will place priority on technical and vocational education. And I want to find out. Uh, I do believe, because I've been at the Ministry of Education also as a Deputy Minister, and I do appreciate that one major failing of our system for training and building skills to service industry and other sectors is the weaknesses in the management of technical and vocational education. How do you intend to fix that sector of our educational system or subsector of our educational system? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe that the Honorable realizes that COTVET, Council of Tertiary Vocational Education and Training, is placed under the Ministry of Education. One of the documents I've been going through is not only their handing over notes they've shared, but their vision going forward. And exactly what you asked is a problem for them. Across, across the length of the government sector, almost every ministry has something to do with vocational technical education from the Ministry of Labor Relations that has probably nearly 60 or so institutions, the Ministry of Local Government, uh, every ministry. And I came to meet a recommendation in a cabinet memo that I've shared that they intend to centralize all those vocational and technical that are scattered across different ministries under the Ministry of Education to give targeted support uh, to those uh, institutions. Uh, that's the first point, to get the cabinet memo to rationalize the spectrum over which vocational and technical education uh, is spread. That huge spread has, be, has become like an orphan. Nobody looks after his or resources are not available to look after. Uh, so that's the first thing, to get that cabinet memo through. The second thing, uh, interestingly, was to look across the board um, as far as the colleges of education are concerned. And I realized, I realized that no college of education teaches or trains teachers in technical and vocational education, or even for that matter, ICT. They don't have it as a course in any of the colleges of education, which, which was frightening to me, uh, that the teachers who are going to teach the basics, the JHSs and things, don't even study or there are no teachers in that thing. So the second thing in line with our manifesto is to at least dedicate or select in every region of the country one or two colleges of education, which we have 40, and I know there are plans to even increase the number uh, to about 48, but to dedicate and upgrade the laboratories and the uh, 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 workshops so that teachers who are going to teach technical and vocational education can have some training. Uh, that would be the second thing. The third thing is that just before this house began, or this section of parliament started, we passed the Technical Universities Bill that is upgrading polytechnics into technical universities. You realize that there's a lacuna for those who have the two, we passed only six, the two who the NCT claims are ready Parliament has to find a way of including them in the list uh, of what Parliament passed. But not only that, to make sure that all the polytechnics are upgraded to technical universities. Not only on paper. I've cited arrangements that are far, far, far advanced for a support from China to equip five technical universities and all the ten technical institutes. We have these technical institutes. And I believe that in the interim, 
we could even let the University of Education or University of Cape Coast to start giving education certificates to the outputs from the technical institutes so that they can start even teaching at the primary level. If you go through the various reforms, educational reforms, one of them that stands out is the Jobo or Zobo, Jobo, Jobo Committee Report that is 73-74 that redefined uh, a pre-tertiary university education from 17 to 12 or 13 years actually, interestingly, about 12 to 13 years. And you find out that as part of that educational reform was technical and vocational education. That was missed or has been missed for a while, like you said, in our JHS uh, curricula uh, and things and education. So we have to go back and see how we can fix that by not only training the teachers, by also using the National Curriculum Authority to start thinking about curricula for that and bringing out even books to help, let alone uh, bringing equipment and teaching materials into school. So it is going to be a huge, a huge undertaking that with the purpose of single-mindedness and the support of parliament, we should be able to achieve that. Because that is where, that is where would help Ghana very much. Because if you look at the countries that are well-versed in technical and vocational, those are the countries that withstood the recesses or recessions that have come across the world, like India, like Germany, like South Korea, like Japan. So we have to look to those countries for support and to help us. So I share with you that as a country, we have not looked at that and we need to refocus. Chairman, I have some uh, follow-up following the narrative of the nominee and will request for specific timelines. I understand from your answer that you intend to work towards the Ministry of Education exercising oversight over other educational institutions that fall under other ministries. When do you intend to initiate this? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Like I said, I've seen a cabinet memo already that was prepared under the previous government. We would have to look at it to re-examine the memo. If there are omissions, do add. If there are deletions, we have to make and send it to the cabinet. So as soon as His Excellency the President gathers the cabinet, uh, I think the decisions will be made. Even before that, I had the chance of speaking to him, and um, he will be responsive to an executive approval in that direction if we are so ready. But Chairman. we have to get his ministers in place to do that for him. Chairman, in his answer, you also related that you intend introducing some new courses in the colleges of education. When will you initiate this? As soon as practical, in the sense that, one, I'm here seeking your blessings to be confirmed as a minister. With that authority that parliament gives, and if I'm sworn in, one of the first things is to meet the College of Education using the National Curriculum Authority, National Accreditation Board, and all those regulatory powers that we have to redirect focus and even select those schools that can help train the teachers in, in technical and vocational skills. So we can expect the initiation of action this year in the year of our Lord 2017? Certainly this year we will initiate action. Honorable Member for Ifia. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chairman. Um, Honorable Minister Designate, concerning the multiple languages that are used to deliver instruction at the formative years of, our, of pupils of the Republic, um, would you share your thoughts on this development, especially when you look at the fact that there is development objective to be achieved at the end, and this situation really contradicts God's instruction in the story of the Tower of Babel, which makes it clear that multiple languages defeat the objective of people working in oneness to achieve the objective and which conforms to today's observations that no country has developed on the back of multiple languages. And that those that have developed are those that are able to express ideas 
and everything in single language in instruction delivery in the formative years of their people. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I don't know whether the biblical story so quoted has that, uh, comes up so succinctly with that meaning. Uh, all I know is that confusion, not determination of purpose, not, not tenacity of purpose. Confusion was set apart because they couldn't hear each other. Uh, going through the notes, I found that one of the policies that are being implemented was teaching the basic schools uh, mother tongue. Uh, I found it fascinating, it exercised my mind a lot, that what are we trying to achieve as a country? Because we don't seem to have learned from our history. Thank God. MPP wants to reintroduce history into our curricula. Why do I say that? Under the, under the presidency of the blessed Osajifu, this same policy of instructing pupils in, in their mother language uh, arose. He even went about setting up an institution at the University of Cape Coast. And he went further than that to decide and decided that Akan will be the language in this country. Just begin to think the problems you designating Akan as a national language. I don't want to think about that at all. It is, it is no surprise it failed. And Ghana, with that same policy, we withdrew. Besides, we don't train only people for only Ghana. We train ourselves to become globally competitive. And, and when you look in, around the world, there's a language of business, there's a language of trade, there's a language of commerce, there's a language of ICT, where even countries with one language learn that as a second language. Thank God we, because of our colonial past, had that language, English. And, and books and everything is written in English. And I think that we have to look at it again, especially for a country with many languages, going to pick one and saying that it should be the dominant language where everybody should learn is problematic. Uh, China has a language, official language, Mandarin. There are different versions of Mandarin, and it's only one version that has been. And even that in China is a problem. So. Not where everybody has a proud culture, history, and tradition, and which, whose history or tradition should be lost <laughs> in making one dominant language. And interestingly, if you're, you and your wife, uh, you're from the coast, Fanti, your wife is from the north, Mamprusi, and you speak different languages, and you live because of work in Volta region, Hohoi, which language would your child be instructed in? And so we have to, as a group, as parliament, think about some of these and decide, because parliament approves policy, and decide for the country where we have to go. I can't think far on that issue. Um, thank you. Um, from the answer you provided, I get the understanding that, so far as your thoughts are concerned, you recommend um, a single language for instruction delivery at the formative years of our people to achieve global competitiveness. And that will make the confusions uh, ease up a bit. The body of knowledge shows that uh, if the primary language of instruction is not the mother language of the child, the child will have to translate the mother language or the native language before he or she reinterprets it into English. That is the body of language. But no country has been able to do that with multiple languages. So that's why you need a single language to be able to, mother language, to be able to do that. Uh, so I think we are benefiting so much from English being our second language. We have to promote it. We have to educate our kids. We have to educate the future generation. We have to drill them, speak and write good English, uh, and, and, and do things in English. Uh, it doesn't make us less human. That is the reality that we have to face. 
Your last Ch question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, over the recent history we've gone through, we've had the term quality education, quality education, quality education. Um, it's almost becoming synonymous to uh, constructing beautiful school edifices and thinking that it is delivery of quality education. What are your thoughts on quality education as uh, in your own uh, response to one of the questions? You said NPP government stand to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One of the lessons I learned in the project management course was not to look out outputs, but rather look out outcomes and impacts. With all our educational reforms and policies that we have achieved, what are the outcomes? The outcomes are not only known locally. We will sit in our country and a UN publication will come, Ghana has been graded in the whole world a certain position. If you sit in your corner and you don't mind what is going on, how come somebody is grading you? So we live in a global world, and we have to face that reality. The earlier we face it, the better it is for us, for a, a, a country. When we take our children to school, there's only one outcome that we want, to become relevant to society. That is the only outcome we want, to educate ourselves and our minds, to know that we live in an interdependent world, to equip us with the technical ability, the skills, the attitudes, and aptitudes as enshrined in our educational policy in Act 778. For to be functional and productive, you need this range of things. So we have to look at the outcomes. But if you look at the outcome of quality education that our children or the next generation passing through should be able to confront the challenges of the world and face it squarely, then you have to come and look at what are the ingredients into, what are the inputs? The inputs are only three I can think of. Teachers, students, and teaching and learning materials. We have to look at it holistically. For teachers, it's not only teachers who are in the school, how you carefully select the teachers who are acting in local parentis. So the teachers, the input into the College of Education matter as much as the output, because they are going to take care and they look after our children more than we do in this world that we are all hustling, mother is working, father is working. It's the teachers who are looking after our children. So you want the best teachers to start off. You don't only want to train them, you want to recruit them, not only recruit them, you want to retain them. That is why my brother was talking about incentives and things. It all matters. The teacher should be a lifelong learner. It should move from, from a duty to a passion. It, it deals with the community respecting the teacher, be the centerpiece of our daily lives. It's not only the government that should recognize the teacher. You as a parent, how are you recognizing or making the teacher feel that after looking after your children, you recognize his or her abilities and, and things. So it is a holistic thing. You have to think about the teacher. You have to think about the students. Now, when I looked, there are no community libraries. So the child, after school, where does he go? The ability to play amongst yourself, to be four years old when you are four years old. It's very, very important. So the ability for the child to learn, we are inculcating in our children lifelong learning. So the teaching and learning materials are also very important. The area in which the child is studying, if you go and put a KG in my constituency, and that KG admits those tiny thoughts, and there's no toilet, there's no water. I'm not sure you want the teachers, I'm not sure what you want the teachers to do. So the environment should also be conducive. So it's a very holistic thing. And uh, yes, government cannot do everything at once, but it has to start. That is why government is continuum. So if governments are built, we would put other
satisfy the availability requirement? And how many of them can you, do you intend to build within the period of four years that the MPP government is in power? Thank you. Um, I, I hope we have a magic number. We don't. We don't because it's a right. It is a right. So whereas economically, you might go into a certain community and there are only few pupils or students there, but because of distances, you may have to locate a school there. Whereas economic decision will have told you, why don't you let the children go to the next biggest town or somewhere? So we, we don't have a number. So if you look at what has been going on, we try and provide the facilities as government is getting money and expanding it and rehabilitating the old ones as we get along. It's going to be that for some time because the, our population is a growing population. Our population is a shifting, very dynamic population. The school you provided in my constituency 30 years ago, that satisfied availability, may not now satisfy availability because uh, uh, it's overpopulated or it's broken down. So that availability question is an ongoing thing that we have to address. So I don't have a magic number for you. Then my second question has to do with the restoration of the teacher trainee allowances. As captured in your manifesto on page 112. That is what you committed yourself to doing. You indicated that you will restore teacher trainee allowances fully. And I just want to know whether by teacher trainee allowances, teacher trainees, you are referring to all teacher trainees in the colleges of education and also those in the universities in the country so that it doesn't become discriminatory. I just want to be clear, just to see clarity on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, for, for a moment, I thought I had lost my manifesto. So I was scratching my head. Under the MPP, page 112, the last paragraph, teacher training allowances will be fully restored. So those who were getting the allowances that were being stopped, it will be restored. OK, and then the last question. The last question. On the same page, on the same page, you talked about the one district, one factory, and how useful the technical universities, the technical universities can be for the realization and successful implementation of that particular pro program. What is the linkage, and how do you intend to link? The, the, thank you, Mr. Chair. The difference between a traditional university that does more cognitive work and technical university that does more psychosomoto, psychosomoto work. Um, can you repeat that word? <laughs> Which one? I've said two. So you've, you, 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 you. I'll make it easier for ourselves. All education affects three things, your head, your heart, or your hands. Head, heart, or hands, three H. And psychomotor, psychomotor is to do with hands. Those, those skills that has to do with hands, like architecture, my brother here, he draws, like the designers, like the sculptors, like the footballers. They, they, they use their hands to much to say. Things that do with your brain are like the philosophers, the scientists, and, and things like that. And, and the, of course, chair, sorry, the lawyers first. <laughs> the. So, like we said, and another honorable said, we've neglected our technical and vocational education for three th reasons, because we haven't paid attention because we have had undue emphasis on university, university, university. Uh, 
to the neglect that inside the minds of most Ghanaians, even when you go to a vocational school or a technical university, you are considered probably second rate, which should not be so. If you want to know how the masses of the people can be employed, if you want to generate jobs, if you want to create jobs, it is to do with people who work with their hands because the jobs would always be available, like hairdressers, like barbers, uh, like auto mechanics. Now, every car that is coming to the country has some sort of electrical brain or electronic brain in it. You don't use our traditional fetus to work on your new, newly bought cars now. They will destroy it for you, honorable. So we need the technical universities, the technical institutes, to start bringing up people who know about such things to repair them. If you go to Swabi Magazine, I don't know whether in 10 years, if we don't use other foundations and these universities to help them out, the, 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 the apprenticeships that are available, whether they will be well prepared and suited and adapted to the cars that are coming. So we need to set up a collaboration, not only at the technical universities, the craftsmen and the professions out there to collaborate so that apprentices can go through both school and apprenticeship training in the various uh, craftsmen's work. That is why there's a need to collaborate vocational and technical education. The normal Yomo Semra would not do my, your mother's hair again. You need sophisticated chemicals that cosmetology will teach you that you have to even understand the, the biology of the hair, what you are applying. So it is important that no matter the profession, the skill or the craft, there should be a sort of education that should collaborate to make it happen and happen better for us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable Minister Nominee, Dr. Mati Opoku Prempe. I think I will start from the technical school and the universities. We have now seen the technical universities in place. How are we going to feed into those universities since we are yet to establish technical training schools? Thank you. It's to do with numbers. Because UEW has a technical component in Mampo, like Kumasi, is to do with technical uh, uh, training. Uh, all the technical institutes, Accra Technical, Tamale Technical, uh, Kumasi Technical Institute, is it in your constituency or mine? Uh, we share border somewhere, it's in the triangle. Uh, they are all the training people to do some of these things that we are saying. But we need to up the ante. If you are going to offer it in JHS and SHS, then you need the teachers themselves to know how to teach these things. And that is why we are upgrading and retooling. And I'm talking about we identify specific colleges of education that can train the teachers to go and train the youth. So it's a, it's a, it's a bold decision our, our manifesto has made and we need total commitment and support to deliver it. Thank you. Honorable nominee, you will take, if, if you take a casual look at our system, where D7 and E8 have become a big hindrance to students who wants to continue to the university education, especially from the rural areas, that get passes. Hmm? You know, what would you do to help these people? We the issue is about is about growth, it's about performance. We shouldn't normally be able to speak that because you went to the rural area, you cannot meet it. You should not normally speak. But if somebody is disadvantaged from start because the parents are poor, 
because they don't have outside school facilities to support. The parents themselves probably are not well educated to encourage or to inculcate in their children uh, the ability to study and do something for themselves in life. Then these become an issue. So you go to Ghana Education Service and you ask for the statistics and more than 50% of their secondary schools are failing. It's, we, we all have to come to realize that you put garbage in, you put garbage out. If, if we don't tackle the issue that is rearing its head in primary and secondary education in this country, the universities can go ahead and increase the number of years you study. It was two years when the Honorable Chairman went to Lagos because the first degree, there was a first university exam that was non-scoring and you did the course in two years. So, to your great point, it was two years. Um, Honorable Member, I learned and passed <laughs> subjects in the first year. <laughs> Even though you will not be failed, uh, yes. they call it FUE, FUE, but you still learn some of the major things. That's why I learned contracts, yes. the law Sir, of contracts. Chairman, that, that is precisely your point that I'm trying to relate to the Honorable Member. <laughs> the universities could afford to do university exams, teach the same course, philosophy, in two years because the input from the six forms that were coming were of sufficient standard. It didn't even matter where you went to secondary school. Even those who went to probably privileged schools, endowed schools, we had parents living abroad who were bringing their children at that age to come to secondary school, boarding schools in Ghana. So the Ghanaians living abroad, it was common. As soon as your son is 11 or 12, go to Ghana, go and finish Upokwari, go and finish Kumasi High, go and finish Achibota, and come back. Because they had faith in the outcomes. Now, a friend of mine made to university, husband and wife, my goddaughter with them, I called last two weeks, where is my goddaughter? He's in an institution in America. They are working their butts out to go and put their child, probably 10 years, in the university, in a school in America, boarding school in America. It should tell you that people are voting with their feet. Anybody who can get the chance sends the child away. But we don't believe in that. So we should sit down and find out whether we shouldn't go back to the basics, to let the children know how to read. And when we say read, read history, read literature, read philosophy, read. We should have national standards for four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, and seven-year-olds. We shouldn't wait till we can't do much or nothing about it in the universities. Now, when you read scripts from the university, anyway, I think we will get the support for us to make some concerted effort to eradicate one another. That is the tool to eradicate poverty, education. Nothing else. Last question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, in recent times, we have seen springing up of private universities. Many of these lack the basic infrastructure in some disciplines. What would you do to ensure quality and standards in those universities? Thank you. The regulator for universities, indeed, is the National Council for Tertiary Education. The regulator for Curricula in universities, the National Accreditation Board. These are the tools. These are the tools to ensure that before you set up as a college or a university, you meet the basic standards to offer the course you are going to offer. So if there's a regulatory problem, pro, uh, problem we have to make sure we address that problem. That is what we have to do. Uh, as a minister, the, 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 there's very little I can do to make sure that those regulatory agencies do their work. Least I be said to be interfering. Least I should be said to be interfering. So if you are a private school, the constitution, in that same article 25 of the constitution, I think the last uh, 25 to every person shall have the right at his own expense to establish and maintain a private school or schools at all levels and of such categories and in accordance with such conditions as they be provided by law. Chairman, law Chairman uh, um, I may have to support the honorable colleague. 
did I just hear you say you are throwing your hands in this bed that when it comes to regulation, assuming that the National Accreditation Board, you have this springing up of tertiary institutions with very questionable qualifications, sometimes not even having it. And that exposes a laxity of a regulatory institution that is not consistent with government policy. You look on and say, because that is interference, honorable. Mr. Chairman, uh, the honorable, if he heard me right, I moved to that second leg. I would make sure the regulatory agencies do their work. That is how, as a minister, I would affect it. I wouldn't go and run and close a school. I'll make sure that the regulatory agencies do their work. That's what I'll do. Honorable Let me let me just follow from where the minority leader left off. Are you aware, Honorable, that the National Council for Tertiary Education is provided for in the Constitution and that they carry out an advisorial role to the Minister of Education. And so they work hand in hand with you and you should not be throwing your hands in despair. Nobody has thrown his hands in despair. It's to use the tools that you have been given by the Constitution and the law to do the work that they are supposed to do. So I'm glad you acknowledge that fact. Can you come with me to your manifesto? I will read a number of statements that you make in your education sector, and you tell this committee if, if you agree with the accuracy of these statements. Page 105, your manifesto says, item F, page 105. Restore physical education and sports as an integral part of a program of wholesome education for a wholesome nation. So you tell us where physical education went to. Uh, Mr. Chair, page, I, I, no, no, let me I have to write because finish. the questions are more than three, so I wouldn't be able to retain. Uh, okay, so, yeah. <laughs> so page 105, restore physical education. I want to know if you agree with that assertion, if it is accurate. Page 107, and you made reference to that earlier. It said the MPP will reintroduce the history of Ghana as a subject for primary schools. I want to know if this is accurate in your estimation. Page number 112. Page number 112. You also say we will also abolish the payment of utility bills by students. Is this accurate? Have utility bills been introduced? And so you will abolish it. I want to know how true this statement is. Still on that page, you also write that with the conversion of the polytechnics into technical universities, have all the polytechnics been converted into technical universities? So can you? Tell this committee if you agree with these statements in your manifesto. Okay. We have the first one, restore physical education as an integral part of a program of wholesome education for a nation. Yes, I believe that when we say that, we just don't mean that children go and play. There should be a concerted effort of physical education, having PE teachers, PE teachers attached to schools. Uh, the word what, is restore, what, restore. Yes, because not all the schools have it, and it's not a priority. And a lot of schools don't have this. They don't even have the playing grounds has been encroached on. So I, I, I'm so sure. So is the word restore? Should you use yes. restore? Yes. Because restore, restore means it has been taken away. It was abolished and you want to reintroduce it? The, the, you have asked about six questions, so in order no, not to get no, an argument, no, no, I can't no. argue there's, with you. Have, it's only one question. I must address the chair. 
Sorry. You don't interfere when he's answering. When he's done and you want to do a feedback, please. I, I, believe, I believe that statement is true because I've heard a lot of teachers, uh, school, uh, headmasters, and people complain. Uh, uh, the colleague, ah, okay. Yeah, the next one. I gave you four, uh, four extracts from your manifesto. That you, re you reintroduce history at the primary level. Um, reintroduce if, history. If, if which, under which course, under which course in the current curricula is history taught? Social studies. So it's social studies, it's not history. Uh, we are saying we are going to introduce history of Ghana as a subject. So it is not done. As a separate subject, you take it out of social studies. Another question. Can, <laughs> yeah, can you respond to the other statements? As, as U utility bills and uh, technical investors. As also. we speak, mm -hmm. in your handing over notes that you gave the ministry, you haven't restored, you haven't abolished utility bills. You set up a committee that is still on debating and discussing. Meanwhile, the ECG is demanding its money. The universities or the tertiary institutions or the secondary schools are intending and charging students to compensate. When we say we are going to abolish it, we are going to say no tertiary institution or secondary institution will be under pressure from ECG to do this. So you think that the the use of abolish. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'll move to my next question. <laughs> I, I know the nominee agrees that all these portions in the manifesto are factually inaccurate. The, the Chair, third, the I disagree third, with that statement on record. Uh, yeah, you, it's, that's your opinion. And I. I'm entitled to mine based on the facts at the Ministry of Education. I have in my hands here, Mr. Chairman, a timetable of schools. This is one from OSU, uh, JHS, just behind here. And PE, fiscal education, is on their timetable. This is it. Honorable Osla, you can have a look. So, so to claim that fiscal education has not been abolished, history has not been abolished, utilities have not been abolished, Honorable Ablaka, are you going to ask the question yes, or get yes. into argument? I am going to ask it, if Honorable Elsler will leave me alone. <laughs> you mentioned my name. <coughs> you mentioned my, my name. It's handwritten. My next, my next. It's handwritten. Yes, that's the timetable from OSU. OSU JHS. OSU JHS. Yes. It's handwritten. Yes, handwritten. that is. Honorable Elsler, OSU order. Timetable there. OSU JHS, go and check. Fiscal education has not been abolished. The chairman, the difficulty is um, which question to choose for the last question. But um, let me, <coughs> let me, let me settle on the the talk in sections of the media that the new government intends to reintroduce the quota system, that you will be restoring the allowances with a quota system. That is the talk in sections of the media. We want to have a commitment from you, whether you, or we want to know from you, to put it more accurately, if you intend to restore the quota system, or if you will restore allowances without introducing, reintroducing the quota system. And, uh, and, and by the way, Mr. Chairman, this is a house of records. Uh, a statement was made that the colleges of education do not offer uh, TVET programs, technical programs. There are 10 of them who offer TVET programs. There are 10 of them, so please, you may want Hello, to check your Hello, please answer the question. Which, which of the questions? The, 
There is only one question on the table Which on one? quota system. Are you bringing back the quota system at the colleges of education in the paying of allowances? I, I was flipping through the manifesto, uh, and our commitment is clear. Our commitment is to restore training allowance. That's all. Mr. Chairman, my question has not been answered. The question is... Please, on the answer is given. Honorable Jato, please answer your question. Thank you very Mr. much. Mr. Chairman, this is Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, in 2004, I think the then government, President Kufo, um, introduced the UTT, UTDB program, uh, program which, which intends the untrained teacher in diploma uh, basic education uh, program. And it intend to train the, uh, to upgrade the untrained teachers, and also those who are within the catchment area to upgrade them so they can recruit them as, as teachers. Um, they completed in uh, 2009, and surprisingly, most of them have not been officially been uh, recruited, engaged. So what, do you, um, what are you going to do to them? Um, are you going to uh, find a place for them so they can... Uh, and do you also intend to continue with the program? Because it's also another program of um, helping them um, increase the, the number of teachers in our schools. So do you intend to continue with that program? I will study the documentation on this program and take appropriate actions. My second question is, um, Coming from a rural constituency, I was going to an island, and then when I got there during my rounds, I met a man, and his concern was that I had my wife, I, we, because of lack of education on this island, I have to go and rent a room for my children below the ages of six and seven, so they can get education in the next community. So I rented a room, and then I kept them there. So every weekend, I asked my wife to send food staff to them. It got to a stage that I the, remember. Please go I, to the I wanted question. to that go to preface, the question. Just to preface that, it, it, it got to a stage. My wife goes there; he won't come back. Then I got there. I realized that the landlord has taken my wife. So, so all I wanted, I no, remember. Please, all I wanted you to do is. Uh, when you go there, try and try and establish. Mr. Chairman, I'm on the floor. Mr. Chairman, how did the landlord take his wife? When order. I don't remember. I don't remember. That is not uh, parliamentary. Please make sure you expunge all the preface. Can, can you go to your question? When you go try and get a school for me in this community, what I am saying is this. Accessibility in our various communities. We know, what are you going to do? Listen to me. What are you going to do to create, to get basic education at least in some of the rural areas that are not accessible, so that at least the children can grow up to a level before they migrate to the next community. Thank you. He wants the nominee to... No. <laughs> to get his wife back. <laughs> Honorable Ranking Member, you're out of order. <laughs> I, I, I suppose that this is a suggestion. I suggest that when we are done with him and his um, minister. A minister, you go and discuss with him and give him those communities for assistance. Mr. Shema, thank you very much. But just, just, to, just to let the, the chair know that um, it's not me, but it's rather a comment from somebody. Yes. It's okay. That's... Somebody's wife, not my wife. <laughs> Do you have any more questions? Can we go on with your next?
Yeah, my next question has to do with the um, um, uh, teacher uh, people uh, uh, textbook ratio. Um, at this stage, I'm rather being informed that it's one is to uh, one is to two. Uh, what are you going to do to improve on the textbook uh, textbook ratio? And also, do you consider uh, courtesy for boys and girls again being introduced? Thank you. I hope that the, the lady is not your wife. And I really hope that you are not there. Uh, honorable nominee, you are out of order. Can you answer the question <laughs> related to <laughs> Your question, please. The teacher, um, people, uh, uh, textbook ratio. What are you going to do to improve it? And do, do you consider introducing a courtesy for boys and girls in our schools? Thank you. Uh, just around. Textbooks have been procured for four. But what we found out that distribution was a problem, and that some had been procured but had not been delivered. And, and I think that we have to sort that one out if it is true that books have been procured and has not been delivered. Uh, if we deliver, it changes the ratio dynamics, and I hope that it is so. If it is not so, I'll tell the House when I'm confirmed what is on the stock books. Will you consider introducing courtesy for boys and girls? For the fact that he's an honorable member, <laughs> I have to answer him. Somebody said he has written a Ghanaian version of courtesy for boys and girls. Maybe it's, it tells us that we have to look at our curriculum well. And what we are giving to the basic, the primary schools, uh, we all have to have an interest in it and decide what, 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 what we do and how we can introduce these things. These things can be extra readings, not necessarily introducing it as, as, a, as a subject. Uh, because that's how I read it as a student's companion. There's another book that went to Kessy for Boys and Girls that every child, my time, we all had copies. Kessy for Boys and Girls in your left hand, and Students' Companion uh, in your right, so that you know your physiology and your axioms and everything. But we developed those things not as curricula, but as outside the school uh, reading clubs and things like that, and encouragement. So we will think about that. You see, we will go back to the three hours, which we've now decided to call it four hours. We will go back to reading and reading everything. We will go back to writing and learn. And no matter the language of instruction, you have to know how to write in that language and be proficient in that writing. We will go back to counting, which is arithmetic. You have to learn how to count and measure. And we will go to the creation, which is play, where children will have to get things to play with to, to, to help build their memories in, in, in other things. Arun Omni, for me, that question raises the bigger question of what kind of manners and values we are inculcating into our children at a very basic age. You have already recognized that the, the parent today is practically an absent parent. And so the children are brought up in the schools. What values, what manners are we inculcating in them for the general good? And I'm interested in knowing how we go about it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had representations about values, just like I have representations about reading and writing habits. Uh, and, and I was thinking uh, people want to encourage that we should introduce phonics uh, into school so that the phonics helps a child to recognize words and pronounce words, and it helps in their reading, no matter the language. So that even if the child meets a different word, a new word, you know how to pronounce it. But Mr. Speaker, I, I, I decided to look for Ghana's educational policy. Uh, the farthest I could get to was Act 778. That was amended with the introduction 
with a, with a return to three years HS. And Mr. Speaker, the Educational Act of 2008 says it all. This is an act to provide for the establishment of an educational system intended to produce well-balanced individuals with the requisite knowledge, skills, values, aptitudes, and attitudes to become functional and productive citizens for the total development and the democratic advancement of the nation. Mr. Speaker, it speaks it all. And, and if we don't have the space to make sure that those four divisions of human learning are the ones that are taught at the basic schools, then we, we would lose out. Because I don't remember how many books I read in Prepper College, but I remember most of the books I read from class one to class six. The reading clubs, the libraries I attended, and things like that. And, and I find myself very privileged to have been able to be exposed to parental support and other support to encourage me in this area. So we have to, as a country, decide that since teachers are providing and doing things more than necessarily to help our children, we have to incentivize and motivate teachers to do these things. Because teachers who live in the community can be the source of the reading clubs. And an honorable member had a problem developing a library in his institution. In, in his constituency. Yes, I'm not going to remember around this chair. Had a problem. When Ghana Library Board came to the presentation, transitional thing, they have no idea and vision to even extend libraries anywhere. If we don't have libraries in communities, what happens after school? So uh, we have to start thinking, rethinking, and thinking again to go back to the basics. And I think that we have to start developing community libraries. And those libraries should be sites that children can go there and even play in far play areas. Uh, Chama, well, sorry, we so we don't know where they're going. Me, when do you intend to commence work on community libraries? Uh, you mean where, uh, 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 which community or? When and where? When? Let's know. Time, when? time uh, uh, is of essence to us and location. When? Yes, because, yes, I was coming to that chair. Uh, one of the one of the reforms, regulatory reforms that I've inherited, even in the handing over news, is to look at Get Fund again. That Get Fund should support Ministry of Education's objectives and policies and programs. So that Get Fund itself does not so much to do what they feel that they have to do. They should dovetail. And I think that one of the priority areas of the next government, of the government now, is to think about community libraries and start developing community. You're still on your Joy News channel on Multi TV, DS TV, and Go TV. Uh, we just brought you live from a Parliament where uh, Minister Designate for Education, Dr. Matthew Opoku Prempe, is before the Appointments Committee of Parliament. And he's been answering uh, quite a number of questions. Uh, relating to the education sector. He spoke about the payment of electricity bills by students and uh, of secondary and tertiary institutions. And uh, well, Honorable Okujatwa Blakwa was quick uh, to rebut and say that what the minister designate had said earlier about physical education and history being abolished is not true. And uh, also he spoke on the recruitment of graduate teachers and um, he was also asked a question on the pupil to textbook ra ratio and uh, also in reintroducing Ketsi for boys and girls there he mentioned uh, that he had heard that there's a Ghanaian version of that book and briefly before we just brought you back into the studio he was talking about the expansion of libraries and saying that that should be the focus of this government and he mentioned that during the transition the Ghana Library Board didn't have uh, a vision on what uh, they hope to achieve with libraries in the country and for him that was not uh, something good and he said um, we must rethink and focus on the basics in the education sector. So currently before 
Parliament's Appointments Committee. Also, we know later today, Dr. Uze Fuyakoto, Minister Designate for Agriculture, and Kwekwa Juman Menu, Minister Designate for Health, will appear before Parliament's Appointments Committee. Uh, we'll now have to cut this program and uh, bring you inside Afghan. Nathaniel Atta uh, will be here with Nana Kwekwa Juman to bring you that show. Thank you so much for your company. My name is Benis Abubedu. For more news, log on to myjoyonline.com. Do enjoy the rest of your day.